Game dev and author Michael Corlum here, and today I'll be playing Infocom's 1982 title, Deadline. As a murder mystery, it's a huge departure from the company's fantasy treasure-hunting Zork trilogy and sets new standards for the genre. It's one of the company's better games, one of the most difficult, and features very well-developed NPCs for the era. I'll be playing the DOS port. It was originally released for the Apple II, Atari 8-bit, C64, TRS-80, Amiga, Atari ST, and Amstrad CPC, but you'll be out of luck buying it today. Activision bought Infocom's properties, and they're not selling it anywhere, so you'll need to find a copy of one of their collections on eBay, or compile the Inform port. The company has allowed hobbyists to recreate the game, but not to offer a pre-compiled version. I'll give you a link to where you can do that if you think you want to figure it out. Like other games of the era, Deadline is limited by a floppy disk storage space, so the developer, Mark Blank, was limited to a scant 80 kilobytes. As a result, they created a number of supporting documents to include with the game, something that would later become sort of a hallmark for the company's games, known as feelies. In this video, we're going to be looking at the supplementary information they gave us, and it really does include vital clues that we can't get anywhere else, so I'm not really going to be able to just skip it to get to the gameplay. It's basically just going to be me reading into the microphone, which honestly isn't too different from me reading off of the screen, but if you'd rather just skip to the gameplay, wait for the next video. First, we have a letter from a lawyer, Warren Coates, asking for our personal involvement on a case as Chief of Detectives. Dear Chief, I must once again ask for your assistance on a case involving some of my clients. As you are no doubt aware, Mr. Marshall Robiner, an industrialist and philanthropist, was found dead yesterday morning in his home. As far as I can determine, he was found dead on the floor of his library, the victim of an overdose of Ubulion, a medicine which he had been taking lately for severe bouts of depression. He had been alone during the night, and the door to his library had been bolted from the inside. Police had to break the door down with axes, I am told, to get inside. While I am completely convinced that there was no foul play involved in Mr. Robner's death, it is disturbing that Mr. Robner had called me only three days earlier for the purpose of informing me that his will was to be altered. In fact, I was expecting to hear from him this week so that he could deliver the papers to me. Given the size of the Robner estate, I feel that a more complete investigation should be undertaken, if for no other reason than to quash the suspicions which are inevitable in these circumstances." I phoned Mrs. Robner this morning and informed her of my intention to have you take on the case. She was reluctant to be of assistance, but I convinced her to allow you to come around at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning and spend the day. I will be at the house at noon tomorrow for the reading of the current will, which Mr. Robner wrote a few years ago. I hope to see you then. Sincerely yours, Warren Coates. So there we have the basic plot. We have our introduction. And again, this is not given within the game, so I'm just going to... Go ahead and read them for you now so you can kind of get an idea of what you would know as a player going into Deadline. Next, we have a crime scene photo, complete with a chalk outline. We can see there's a book here, a teacup and saucer, and some kind of pills scattered on the floor. And the game did actually include the pills. Uh, there was a small baggie, and I'm going to guess they were sugar pills or something equally inert. Though I do wonder if anyone ended up just taking them. Uh, later releases of the game just included a photo of the pills rather than the actual ones, but they did, you know, fabricate them for the first run. We also have the coroner's report. Our victim is Robner Marshall, and he died of an overdose of the drug Ebolin. We also get interviews with each of the suspects. These are a bit long, but I'm going to read them because, again, this is the information the game presumes we know going into the case. First, we have an interview with Mrs. Robner. How did you come to find Mr. Robner? When I woke up this morning, I noticed that Marshall was not in bed. I wasn't alarmed, really, as it was not unusual for him to work late at night in the library and fall asleep there. I went down the halls of the library and knocked on the door. He didn't answer, so I knocked even harder. When that didn't work, I started calling his name loudly. So loudly, actually, that I woke up Mrs. Dunbar and George. We were all gathered there, knocking and yelling, and finally Mrs. Rourke, our housekeeper, was alarmed enough to come upstairs. She suggested calling the police, which we did. They arrived about 20 minutes later and started breaking down the door with axes. When we entered the room, we found Marshall lying on the floor face down. Did he usually keep his door locked when he worked? Almost always. He was pretty secretive about his work, and he liked to be alone when he worked. Do you know of any reason why your husband might have wanted to take his own life? He's been very depressed, you know. His business, Robner Corporation, is not doing well, and there is talk of selling out to a larger firm. 
Marshall founded the company, what, about 26 years ago, and has been desperately trying to find some way to save it. The pills we found by his body, do you know what they are? Yes, those were e-billing tablets. It's an antidepressant that the doctor prescribed for him just last week. Had he been acting less depressed since then? I really don't know. I haven't noticed much change. Did your husband ever talk of suicide? He did, actually, though I never took it seriously. He would talk about how everything would be easier if he were dead. But then he would start to, again talking about how he was going to have to keep the business going. I'm stunned, really. Mrs. Robner, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to kill your husband? Why, no, of course not. He wasn't a very friendly man. He was quiet, but he was a great philanthropist, you know, and everyone that knew him respected him. I can't imagine someone willing to hurt Marshall. Do you really suspect he didn't commit suicide? I don't suspect anything. I just want to understand what's happened. Interview with Mrs. Dunbar. You are Mr. Robner's personal secretary, is that right? Yes, sir. I understand that you were the last person to see Mr. Robner alive. Could you tell me about that? Why, yes. I brought him some tea about 11 p.m. that night. On nights when he expected to work late, he would always expect tea at that hour. I brought him the tea, and he asked me to leave. That's all. Did Mr. Robner seem at all upset? He did appear quite nervous, but he'd been upset for some time, as you know. Do you know what he was working on that evening? No, I wasn't with him, except for that one time. Do you recall whether the pills, the ebullion pills, were on the desk when you came in? No, I don't remember that. Miss Dunbar, were you with Miss Robner when the door was opened by the police? Yes. Do you remember her reaction, anything she might have said? She didn't really react much. I don't think she said anything other than, he's dead, or something of the sort. She just stood there with the rest of us until you people arrived. How are the Robners getting along? I mean, were they happily married? I don't think so, really. He was so quiet and, well, dreamy. She was always scolding him for paying too much attention to the business and to his good works. They rarely went out lately, which seemed to upset Mrs. Robner quite a bit. She had friends of her own she used to visit. I think she would have gone insane otherwise. Thank you, Miss Dunbar. Oh, one last thing. You prepared the tea for Miss Robner. Yes, I started the water boiling, about a quarter of, and then poured the tea when I heard the whistle from the living room. You weren't in the kitchen during that time. I just told you, no. Was anyone else awake in the house while you were waiting? Yes, I believe that both George and Mrs. Robner were awake. I remember George coming down, reading for a bit, and then retiring. Do you believe anyone might have a reason to kill Mr. Robner? No, I can't imagine it. Thank you, Miss Dunbar. Oh, Miss Dunbar, were you home all night, last night, I mean? Well, no, actually. I was out with a friend last night, and we didn't get back around 10.30 or thereabouts. Thanks again, Miss Dunbar. Interview with Mr. Baxter. You were Mr. Robner's business partner, is that correct? That's right. How long have you and Mr. Robner been partners? For about 25 years now, I was his partner from almost at the start of the business. Mrs. Robner tells me that there have been problems lately with the business. Could you tell me what that's all about? Yes, the business has its problems, some of them quite large. Marshall and I were working on a plan to solve these problems and get the company back on its feet again before we would be forced to take drastic action. I hope that I can hold things together now that Marshall is dead. He was the founder of the business and controlled many things by himself. Did Mr. Robner ever talk to you about personal problems or how he felt? No, we were business partners, not intimate friends. I don't think he had any close friends. I know he had gotten very upset about the business, but that's the extent of it. When was the last time you saw Mr. Robner? Yesterday afternoon at our office in town. And where were you after work? Last night was my concert night at the Hartford Symphony. I go there quite regularly. After the concert, at around ten o'clock, I went home. I received a call from Miss Dunbar this morning telling me of the tragedy, and I arrived here just a few minutes ago. Were you at the concert alone? Quite alone. Do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm Mr. Robner? No, except for George, of course. During some of their shouting matches, I've heard George threaten Marshall, but I don't really think he ever would have followed through. Shouting matches. George and Marshall are always at odds, you see. George has been living like a spoiled child all his life. He's 25 now and has never held a job, just spends money or gambles it away. But the, being the Robner's only child, he gets away with murder. Marshall would lecture him and threaten to cut him off without a cent, and then the yelling would start. Eventually, Marshall would give in. 
And when was the last time you heard this? Actually, I heard it again just last week. Strange, now that I think of it, they went at it just last week. I hear that Marshall told George that he had decided to disinherit him. He even mentioned it to me at the office the next day. He seemed serious. I suppose that the financial troubles at the company may have been responsible for his attitude. Are you at the house often? You say you have heard some of these shouting matches. Well, I'm not really here often, only on occasion. I have heard it once or twice and have been told of other times. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. Interview with Mrs. Rourke. Mrs. Rourke, how long have you been working as a housekeeper for the Robiners? Ever since the house was built six years ago. Tell me all you remember from the night of the murder. I remember that about 10.30 or so. You mean 10.30 p.m.? Yes. By 10.30, when I went to my room to do some reading, everyone was upstairs except Miss Dunbar, who had just returned home. She was upstairs at about 11, bringing Mr. Robner his tea. He almost always takes his tea at 11. I remember saying goodnight to her on the way up, and that's the last I heard until this morning, with all the shouting and banging and going on upstairs. No, that, that isn't right. George was downstairs also for a while, but only for ten minutes or so. Could someone have come upstairs during the night? I don't rightly think so, at least not before three or four. You see, I like to do some reading late at night, and I was reading this really exciting mystery story. And, uh, Lord, I was up until nearly four o'clock before I finished. And who do you think the murderer was? Really, Mrs. Rourke, let's stick to the matter at hand. Do you keep your doors closed at night when you're reading? Yes, sir. So then it's possible that someone might have entered the house and gone upstairs without your knowledge. No, sir, I don't believe so. Why don't you try the stairs yourself? For our new house, these stairs are the noisiest I've ever heard. My door is right beside them, too. When the Robners owned a little cat, I remembered hearing every footstep creaking up the stairs. Don't know why they don't ever fix it. I guess it doesn't bother them any. But it is possible that someone might have entered after you went off to sleep. Well, I suppose it might be, but not before. How long has Miss Dunbar been living here? Ever since the place was built. She does an awful lot of work for Mr. Robner, you know. I don't think he could have gotten along without her, though that's not my business to say. He was always so nervous, fretting about everything and forgetting to do this and that. It seemed that she was always covering his tracks, if you get my meeting. Do you have any reason to suspect anyone of wanting to harm Mr. Robner? Well, of course, I've heard all of the screaming and fussing with George and Mr. Robiner. That's been going on for years now, so I don't make much of it any more. No, I can't imagine anyone wanting to hurt poor Mr. Robiner. He was such a sweet man. Thank you, Miss Vork. All right, last one. This is George Robiner, the son. Mr. Robiner, I've been told by Mr. Baxter that you and your father had some serious arguments lately. Can you tell me what they were about? Oh, I don't think that's your business. I'm told they had to do with your habit of wasting or gambling away your father's money. So? I've even been told that he threatened to disinherit you. Yeah, he said he was going to. I'll bet he didn't, though. He never has. Mr. Robner, let me be frank. I'm told you threatened violence against your father as recently as a week ago, and now he's dead. Look, I don't know what you're driving at. You find the poor guy dead in his room. The room is locked. His bottle of medicine is nearly empty. What sort of detective are you, anyway? I'm doing the asking, if you don't mind. Then ask someone else. At the bottom here, we have an official memo uh, from the interviewing detective. Though it appears that at least one member of the Robner household had a reason for wishing Mr. Robner dead, the findings of the medical examiner and evidence gained from the interviews of the family and family associates are only consistent with the conclusion that Mr. Robner died of a self-administrated overdose of Ubilon. So, there we go. There we have our, our scenario. And at the very end, we get this handwritten note summarizing what the interviews and evidence so far tell us, along with more instructions for the player. We have until 8 p.m. when the case will be closed. We need to make sure we have evidence of method, motive, and opportunity before we arrest someone. And that's the end game. We make an arrest. If we choose right and have enough evidence, we win. If not, well, a, a murderer goes free. Again, apologies for spending so much time in the supplementary material, but it really is meant to be part of the gameplay experience, and we have some clues in those interviews that we won't get from talking to suspects. Without further ado, let's get to the game. Deadline, an interlogic mystery. Copyright 1982 by Infocom Incorporated, all rights reserved. Deadline and Interlock are trademarks of Infocom Incorporated. 
This is release number 27, serial number 831005. South Lawn, you are on a wide lawn just north of the entrance to the Robner Estate. Directly north at the end of a pebbled path is the Robner House, flanked to the northeast and northwest by a vast expanse of well-kept lawn. Beyond the house can be seen the lakefront. All right, well, let's go north. One of the nice things about these Infocom games is that you can uh, shorten a lot of commands, and N for north works just fine. So let's go north. Front path. You are at the Robner's front door, which is closed. You can walk around the house from here to the east or west. To the south, a rolling lawn leads to the entrance of the estate. Let's go ahead and open the door. The front door is now open, and we will go north to go inside. Mrs. Robner appears, walking down a hallway from the north. Hello, she says. I'm Mrs. Robner. Please come in. I'm afraid I really can't help you much. This is surely a terrible waste of time, not to mention upsetting, having all these police marching around the house. This has been a trying time, as I suppose you can understand. As I told Mr. Coates, then the other detective, you may look around, but you must be out by eight o'clock at the latest. Oh, I almost forgot. Mr. Coates will be reading my husband's will at noon in the living room. You may attend if you wish. I'm going to make myself some breakfast now. I'll be around all day if you need anything. I'll do what I can to help. Good day. Foyer. This is the foyer of the Robner house, beautifully appointed with a fine crystal chandelier, marble floors, and a large marble-topped table. The front door, to the south, is closed. The foyer continues north. Mrs. Robner heads off to the north. And so the big innovation in Deadline is that the NPCs move around the game and have motives and schedules of their own. This is a, a big departure from the static worlds common to interactive fiction games of the era. Like in Mission Asteroid, we have a Deadline. Eight hours to solve the mystery, and we each turn spends a minute of that time. We need to think in four dimensions here. Time is more than a deadline, as different events will occur, like the reading of the will of the noon in the living room. But that applies to our six suspects as well. No matter what we do, they'll be moving around pursuing their own agendas as well, making knowing their schedules important, which is another kind of map you can make while playing. Uh, I find that spreadsheets work very well for this kind of thing. However, your actions can interfere with their schedules, and they will react to what you're doing, which will change the effective you know, event map as well. So it's really kind of a complicated thing uh, to keep in mind. So it's, you know, treat them, expect them to react like normal people would if you accuse someone of murder, and they are the murderer, they will take steps to try to protect themselves or get away if you don't arrest them first. Uh, the map itself isn't very big, a good-sized interactive fiction game of this era may have, you know, upwards of 40 rooms to it. Uh, Deadline doesn't. It's just the mansion and the area around it. So uh, the complexity really does come from the, the time element. Going north. This is a hallway north of the foyer. To the west is an open doorway, and to the east is the foot of the staircase. The hall continues north. Mrs. Robner heads off to the north, and as you can see, NPCs actually traverse the locations. They don't just teleport to where they need to be. I'm going to go east, bottom of the stairs. You're at the foot of the stairs to the second floor. Open archways lead west and south. I'm going to go up twice. You are on a landing halfway up the flight of stairs. You notice that the stairs do indeed make quite a noise when stepped upon as we did read during the interviews. And that's why I didn't skip them, even though it took a long-ass time to do it. Uh, we did get a lot of information there that will inform our choices here. Note that I have played and beat this game before, so I'm going to, you know, but I'm going to try to play it as if I hadn't for the sake of, uh, you know, showing it off to you guys. Top of stairs. You're at the top of the staircase where the short hallways run north and south and a corridor run the length of the house west. All right, so we're going to go west. Hallway, you are just west of the staircase. There are doors on both sides, north and south of the hallway, which continues east. Oh, I'm sorry, which continues west. Both doors are closed. West again. This is approximately the middle of the corridor, a convenient place for a closet full of linens. Stairs to the east and a window to the west are about equidistant. The closet to the north is open and rather shallow. And if you watch the... Um, video where I play Mission Asteroid, you can see that the prose here is much better. I mean, it's not it's not great literature by any means, but it is 
competently written, which is, you know, always nice. The section of hallway is near the west end, though the window at the end of the hall, you can see some trees and lake beyond. The hallway continues east and west, and a door to the south is closed. I'm going to go west one more time. This is the west end of the upstairs hall. To the north is the library, where Mr. Robner was found. Its solid oak door has been knocked down and is lying just inside the entrance to the library. A window which cannot be opened is at the end of the hallway. All right, so we're going to go into the library. This is the library where Mr. Robner's body was found. It is decorated in a simple but comfortable style. Mr. Robner obviously spent a great deal of time here. A wide executive desk sits before tall balcony windows which lie at the north of the room. A telephone is sitting on the desk. The east side of the room is composed of three large bookshelf units containing numerous volumes on many topics. The room is carpeted from wall to wall. The massive oak door which has blocked the entrance has been forcibly knocked off its hinges and is lying in the doorway. A pencil is lying on the floor near the desk. Beside the desk is a large collapsible tray. Sitting on the tray is a bowl containing a white powdery substance. Alongside the desk is a wicker white waste paper basket. The waste paper basket contains a bunch of crumpled papers. Lying on the floor, overturned, is a beautiful saucer. Lying on its side, lying on the floor, is a beautiful teacup. Lying up top the desk is a pad of white note paper. A desk calendar is here, open to July 7th. There is a bottle of Ubilian here. All right, so we're going to start investigating the crime scene at this point, uh, which is going to be mostly looking at stuff. So let's... Can we just X? Let's see if we can just X. X is a common uh, abbreviation for examine. But it's not going to let us do that, so we're going to examine oak door. The door is a magnificent solid oak piece. Its metal bolt is bent, and the metal piece which has, has been rested has been sheared off the door frame. It seems clear the door was securely locked from the inside when it is, was broken down. So we have confirmed that this is indeed a locked room mystery. Examine papers in the wastebasket. These, there are three wads of paper. One is a shopping list. Another is a list of current stock prices. The last is the start of a letter to the board of directors of the Robner Corp. Unfortunately, it does not contain enough information to allow even a guess about the intent of the letter. All right. Let's take a look at the key teacup. If I can spell it, teach up. The cup is painted with a scene from Greek mythology and has a brown discoloration at the bottom. Let's take a look at the bottle of pills. All right, here we have the label. It's got the uh, the patient, the drug, directions. Uh, take one or two twice daily for depression. May be harmful or fatal in sufficient dosage. So there we have the basic premise. The belief, the working theory, is that he uh, died of intentional overdose. But the you know lawyers having us check it out just in case. Take a look at the carpet. The carpet is an expensive affair and quite clean except for a few small areas of dried mud in the vicinity of the desk. There are no other stains or markings that you can see. Hmm. That's out of place. Let's take a look at the mud. And this is cool because you can like drill down and look at the details and everything. And this is, you know, detective work. The spots seem to be dry dirt or mud and are bunched in the area between the balcony and the desk. All right. I'm going to get a few pieces of evidence here. I assume they've all been, you know, looked over already. So picking them up isn't going to be a problem. I think we can do multiple objects like this. Yep, there we go, grabbed them all. So yeah, detective work is basically two parts. You're uh, examining the crime scene, finding evidence and talking to suspects and putting together a working theory. That is the job of the detective. Uh, all right, and we're gonna try the old uh, trick Rub pencil on pad to see if there are any impressions left behind uh, from anything from the previously written thing. And there are. Uh, shading the pencil, the paper with the pencil reveals impressions left by writing on the previous sheet. 
The writing must have borne down heavily, but only a feud comes out clearly. Uh, we see Baxter's time, first time, second time, consist maybe, uh, something maybe merger, 20th or 30th, uh, force, documents, possess, replica, focus, reconsider, late, and then marshal at the bottom. I, I assume, I, I don't know exactly what this says. But we have some a, a few clues, you know, that we can look out for. Possibly some kind of merger, uh, something about focus, something. I don't know. But it'll make sense later, hopefully. Um, and it, again, the, the date itself might be important, the 10th or the 20th, I don't know. I'm going to drop the pencil now because that's all we needed it for. And the, like a lot of games... Uh, you are limited to how much you can carry in your inventory. It's not too bad in this game because there's not a lot you need to pick up and carry around, but we don't want to stay burdened. All right, the calendar is open to July 7th. The only listing here is an appointment with Baxter at 2 p.m. at the Robner Corp. office. Let's see what... Now remember, uh, our victim was found in the morning of the 8th, so the 7th was really what he was supposed to be doing yesterday, the day he was still alive. The 8th, the day he was found, uh, this is what he was planning to do. There is only one notation here in the 9 a.m. spot, call Coates, will completed. All right, so uh, our victim was found in the morning of the 8th, estimated to have died at 1 a.m. He was planning to call his lawyer about a new will that day, but hadn't done so. Depending on the new will, that could be a powerful motive, especially for George. Or possibly his wife, depending. I don't know. All right. Now, as I said, as a detective, we're, we're examining crime scenes. However, we are not a forensic uh, tech. So if we want to analyze anything, we, we can analyze cup. Sergeant Duffy walks up quietly as a mouse. He takes the cup from you. I'll return with the results, he says, and leaves as silently as he entered. So where did he come from? Uh, well, Duffy is just sort of around out of sight, and he'll come back in 20 minutes or so with a lab report. That's really quick, not only for forensic analysis, but to get to back to and from the lab. But that kind of analysis is one of the key tenets of an investigation like this, along with the suspect interviews that we'll be doing. All right, so we found the mud on the carpet. Let's see what that's about. There is a window in here, so let's open the window. The balcony door is now open. All right, let's go out into the balcony. The balcony is bare of furniture, though it has a beautiful view of the rose garden, the north lawn, and the lake. A metal railing around the balcony prevents an accidental drop to the thorny roses below. The window between the balcony and library is open. Way to the north, Mr. McNabb can be seen mowing the grass. All right. The only thing up here is the railing. Let's take a look. The railing is made of sturdy metal and hay helps prevent nasty falls. There is a small area of paint scraped off the outside edge. Which, there we go. We have a clue. Uh, what it means yet, we don't know. And it may not mean anything. It could have been that way for a long time. But we'll see. But with, combined with the blood, it means that some... Uh, combined with the mud, it may mean that someone came up from the garden below. Uh, and I don't know what they did. Maybe they beat him to death with a saucer, well, except the fact that his cause of death is the drug overdose. Back to the library, back to the hall. Note that the descriptions of the rooms are missing now. This goes back to the days when these games were played over uh, teletype. You know, instead of having a monitor, the very first games like Adventure would have, uh, and the very first Zork, played on mainframes, they would print out all the descriptions of everything you were seeing onto paper. So to save paper, once you'd seen a room, uh, it would not give you that description again because you could just go back and read it. We can't really do that here. We can't even scroll. But if we wanted to, uh, we could look around the area again or set the descriptions to verbose and get them every time. Uh, we're not going to, though. Go back down the hall. And this time we're going to go south. 
South upstairs hall. The hallway turns a corner here and continues east to the north as the head of the stairs. A door to the south is open. All right, let's go to this south door. Dunbar's bathroom. This bathroom contains the usual sink, toilet, and bath. A medicine cabinet closed is above the sink. A door to the north is open. All right, let's take a look at the cabinet. It's closed. Okay, it's not the kind with a mirror on it, which is too bad because we can't look at ourselves. So let's go ahead and open it. Opening the cabinet reveals a bottle of low blow, a bottle of cough medicine, and a bottle of aspirin. Drink cough medicine, because I can't help but think this adventure would be better if we were robo-tripping. But no, it, it wouldn't agree with us, all right. Oops. All right, Mrs. S. Dunbar, low blow, take one tablet three times daily. Fismo Labs, Kingsington, Ontario. Low blow brand of Methsporin, USP. Low blow may be dangerous when used in combination with other medications. Please read the enclosed circular prior to using these tablets. I don't know what Methsporin is. Uh, I don't know if it's a real thing. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, who knows. But this is another... But this is another drug that uh, is dangerous combined with other drugs, which may be a clue. And we'll go back down. And we're going to go west this time. Sergeant Duffy appears before you, holding the cup carefully in his hands. His quiet efficiency and youthful vigor impresses you quite a bit. The cup, he begins, contains a trace of tea. The fingerprints of those are Mr. Robner. All right. Pretty much what we expected from the top, from the cup, and I think this is what the lab report we saw earlier in the feelies told us too. So we're just going to drop the cup. And we're going to analyze the saucer. Did we look at the saucer? I don't think we did. And painted with a mythological scene. A couple of small areas of discoloration. Does that match the cup? Yeah, I mean, sure. All right, so we'll analyze saucer. Make sure they match. And he takes it and leaves. And it takes again around 10, 20 turns for him to get back. I, I don't know if it's random. I, I haven't really kept track. Where am I? Okay. Living room. This is a large and impressive room whose furnishings bespeak the great personal wealth of the Robners. The south side of the room is a large bay window, now closed, which looks out into the front yard. A wood pile sits behind a huge fieldstone fireplace. A double doorway leading to the main hall is the only exit. Pictures of Mrs. Robner's colonial ancestors line one wall. The room contains formal seating for at least 15 people and several main groups of chairs and couches. Tables and cabinets, all of the finest mahogany and walnut, complete the furnishings. On one of the tables is a telephone, and sitting on a table is a hardcover book. Mrs. D Miss Dunbar is sitting on the sofa here. And we can start examining things. Let's take a look at the book. A novelization of Deadline, a classic work of computer fiction. The book we are in. So let's go ahead and read the book. The book is a novelization of Deadline. You start to read it, and it seems oddly familiar as if you had lived it. And, well, there we go. We don't really need it, so we'll just drop the book. What is our score so far? You're an amateur inspector at best. Oh, that's that's mean. It has been a long day, hasn't it? <sighs> so we're just, at this point, going to be waiting for Duffy to get back. So we'll uh, hang out and look at what else is in the room. Uh, let's take a look at the look 
out window. Let me see the south lawn, okay. There's nothing special about the fireplace, which is the generic default. Don't worry about this object response. Uh, portraits isn't even in the, oh, maybe pictures. There are five portraits, two on each side of the big bay windows. The fading portraits are members of the Phillips family, among the oldest in New England. All right. Uh, we're just going to kind of wait until done until uh, we get our report on the saucer. The telephone rings. Do we want to keep waiting? Uh, no. And, and this is an event. Again, it occurs regardless of where we are in the house. The phone will ring at this point. Uh, so let's go ahead and answer it. You take the phone and hear an unfamiliar man's voice say, Hello, is Leslie there? You start to reply, but Mrs. Robner enters and takes the phone from you. Thank you, Inspector, she says, and then into the telephone. Hello? Oh, hi. I can't really talk right now. I'll call you back soon. Okay, bye. She hangs up and starts towards the door. Mrs. Robner heads off to the east. And this is a situation where timing is kind of important because we want to overhear what she's saying. So let's go ahead and wait for her to... Uh, to call whoever that is back. Give it two waits, I guess. All right. Now we can pick up the phone in here and listen in. You can hear Mrs. Robner in a man's voice you don't recognize. Much too early to consider it. But we couldn't have planned it better. You're free. Yes, but it will. Wait a second, I think. Click. You realize the call has been disconnected. Okay, so there's something going on with Robner. Maybe she's having an affair, uh, but she uh, does not seem to have implicated herself in the murder directly here, although this is a motive, perhaps. We'll go east to the foyer, south, and someone's coming down the stairs. Let's wait and see who it is. All right, it's Mrs. Robin. Yeah, we're going to wait. And ducks into the room of the west. Yes, again. And that's the nice thing. You can wait, and uh, it will uh, let you stop waiting if something happens in your vicinity. Sergeant Duffy appears before you, holding the sofa carefully in his hands. His quiet efficiency and youthful vigor, etc., etc. The saucer, he begins, contains traces of tea and sugar. The fingerprints of those are of Mr. Robner and Ms. Dunbar. With that, he leaves, handing you the saucer as he whisks away. Uh, now, that's interesting, because the tea, the, the saucer, did not have traces of uh, sugar. Which, what, what could that possibly mean? Well, uh, it's a different cup. Maybe they, they, they were not exactly matched. Um, that is a possibility. It's It's... it's and what does that mean? Well, we, we don't know exactly, but it is something to pay attention to. Um, we're going to continue waiting just a little bit longer for an event that I know is going to come. And this is one of the benefits of uh, having played the game before, is that there are certain events that you can wait for. George enters the hallway for the east, but he's not what we're waiting for. Uh, George leaves... To the north. And everybody's going about their business. Mrs. Rourke. Did I miss it? No, I didn't. Ah, here we go. There's a short rap on the door. A moment later, a thin envelope appears under the door. Do you want to keep waiting? No. And uh, is this cheating? I mean, not really. Because this game is complex enough that you will have to play it multiple times to figure out everybody's schedules and when important events occur. Because some of them give you a fairly short window. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, examine the letter. 
Fine. Examine the envelope. Canaan, Connecticut Post Office for Mrs. Robner. Let's open it. And there's a letter. Read letter. Sorry, read letter. Dear Leslie, I am sorry to learn that Marshall has been despondent again. His obsessive interest in business must be causing you terrible anguish. It doesn't surprise me that he talks of suicide when he's in this state, but the thought of the business going to Baxter after he's gone will keep him alive. So George has finally gone too far. It's hard to believe, after all those empty threats, that Marshall actually followed through. It serves that little leech right. If you ask me, that means that this means that should the unthinkable happen, you will be provided for as you deserve. I'll see you Friday as usual. Love, Stephen. All right, there we go. We have some kind of motive here for the wife. And we can ask her about that next time we see her. But that's Mr. Baxter watching us, you know, re oh, open someone else's mail. Uh, North of the foyer, Mr. Baxter is heading this way too. We're at the corner of two halls, one a short hallway to the west, ending in a set of doors, and the other a long hall leading south towards the front door. To the north are swinging double doors leading into the kitchen. Mr. Mr. Baxter, off to the south, ducks into the room to the west. All right, well, we are going into the kitchen because I have a suspicion about the plates and saucers. This is the Robner kitchen, quite large with the full component of appliances and labor-saving devices. On one wall, a beautifully crafted shelf unit contains rare china, a unique hand-painted family heirloom depicting the scenes from Greek mythology. The china consists of many plate settings of plates, teacups, and saucers. There are several cabinets which likely contain silverware, glasses, and the like. To the east is a pantry. So let's take a look. How many cups are there? There are six cups. All right. And how many saucers? Which saucers do you mean? The group of saucers or the saucer? Uh, all right. Well, let me go uh, south. Drop the saucer. They're, they're, the disambiguation is confused between the object I'm carrying. There we go. Now we'll count saucers. There are seven hand-painted saucers. So there's one more saucer than cup, which means that... Uh, there's a the missing cup is probably the one that uh, that uh, possibly the one that that um, Robner was drinking from before he died. Uh, someone replaced it because again there is sugar in the saucer but not in the teacup, so it looks like someone was trying to make it look like a suicide. There we go. Now we're gonna go back. To the foyer, passing Mrs. Robner. Uh, well, she's... We don't need to bugger about her letter right now. But we are going to go outside. Oh, it's already open. Well, that's good. Mr. McNabb is off to the east. We're at the front of the Robner house, just east of the front door. A small window closed into the key lock is the only thing of note here. To the northeast is the east side of the house, where Mr. McNabb is. He's the gardener. An ornately caned, carved cornerstone of the house is nearby. <clears throat> Read cornerstone. And it's, you know, the detail of the game. That's a fun little Easter egg, I guess. East again. East lawn. You are on a neatly manicured lawn east of the house, which extends north to the and east to the shore of a lake. To the northwest is a peaceful orchard, and towards the south, another wide lawn. Southeast, beside the lake, is a small shed with a solitary dirty window. Mr. McNabb is here, examining his work. Let's talk to him. Well, we can talk to him later. Uh, there's more business to attend to first. Let's go to that uh, shed. The small garden shed is filled with implements of gardening and lawn care. Shelves filled with various tools line the wall, and a filthy window looks out into the lawn. Leaning in the corner is a wooden ladder. All right. 
The ladder is a typical gardening ladder, about 15 feet long and caked with dirt and dried mug. Mud. All right, nothing really unusual about that. Examine mud. Yeah. All right, well, but it is uh, long enough to reach the second floor library if that were the means to do so. And we're going back around the other side of the house to uh, the front path. And we are again going to wait for an event. And we're gonna try just waiting until, let's say 11, because uh, it will stop if, some, if something happens. Nope, nothing happened. All right, wait until 12. Uh, Mr. McNabb, just serious in sight. Do we want to keep waiting? Yes, let's keep waiting. The local paper boy, an amazing athletic feat, throws a newspaper towards the house from a distance of at least 100 feet. It lands beside the front door rather than the bushes. Do we want to keep waiting? No, this is what we're waiting for. Get newspaper. Well, we want to get it before anyone else does. Read newspaper. The Daily Herald is a local newspaper in two sections. In your cursory look at the first, you find a brief obituary for Mr. Robner. It details his career, including the formation of Robner Corp. A few years ago, Mr. Robner and the Robner Corp were given a prestigious award for works within the community. At the same time, Robner said, I am proud to accept this award for the corporation. Robner Corp is my whole life, and I will continue to guide it for the public interest as long as I live. Robner himself has won two great public acclaims for his charitable works. Now, there is a second section, so let's read second section. And your study of the second section, a small item in the financial section catches your eye. A merger become between Robner Corp and Omnidyne is set to be included shortly. There's a picture of Mr. Baxter with Omnidyne President Starkwell, both smiling broadly. Baxter is quoted as saying that the deal will enable the financial ailing Robner Corp to continue to pursue, produce the highest quality products. The article points out that Marshall Robner, who founded Robner Corp but is no longer its major stockholder, has been found dead yesterday morning, an apparent suicide victim. Baxter is quoted as saying that Robner was in full agreement with the terms of the merger. I don't think he was. And here we go. Again, we have motive for another uh, one of our, our NPCs. All right, so we can uh, go ahead and uh, try to find McNabb. I don't remember where he went. I think he's east, maybe. And that's the problem with these wandering NPCs. Oh, there he is. He's off to the west. Okay, but first I'll go ahead and read this. You're on a path at the edge of a small orchard of fruit trees, which abuts the eastern side of the back of the house. The orchard is obviously intended more to display the beauty of the blossoms in spring than to produce significant amounts of fruit. The windows of the kitchen look out onto the orchard, though your view of them is blocked by the trees and a small grape arbor. To the west is a path along a rose garden and lawn sweep out to the north and east. McNabb is off to the west. Well, let's go see him. Oh, wrong button. Garden path. You're at the edge of a large rose garden, meticulously maintained by the gardener, Mr. McNabb. He is said to be exceedingly proud of this particular garden, which is the envy of the neighbors. Rows of roses are neatly arranged, and the sweet fragrance of the flowers is worth a trip here in itself. An orchard to the east contains many varieties of fruit trees, and wide lawns lie off to the west and north. The roses themselves are to the south, filling the area between you and the back of the house. McNabb is here, planting seeds. He seemed quite worked up and is talking aloud to himself. All right, well, let's say hi. Hello, McNabb. He answers absently and starts to mumble quietly about the roses. And we can talk to people or give them orders by just using their first name or their name and then what we want to say. So, McNabb, what is wrong? He tells you his story. I kind of wish this was, you know, dialogue but I guess it doesn't have to. He was tending to the roses this morning when he noticed two deep holes in the garden with a few crushed roses nearby. He doesn't know when he'll be able to repair the damage. This sounds like the perhaps created by the ladder. 
McNabb, show me holes. Follow me, he says, and starts walking towards the roses. All right. We're going to follow him. You are among rows of roses. The ground is soft, and your footprints leave a rather bad impression, as many poor ceilings are trampled underfoot. A safe place to admire the flowers lies to the north. A window to the south allows a view into the house. There is no way into the house from here. McNabb grabs your arm and leads you to a spot deep within the garden and near the house. You might never have found this place alone, which is why we sought him out. He points to the ground, where you see two holes in the soft earth, and then heads off to the north. All right, so let's take a look at these holes. There are two holes here, each about two inches by four inches. They are at least three inches deep, and the soil is compacted around them. Huh? Let's uh, look at it again. Let's look at the ground. You're making quite a mess, but you do run across tiny pieces of a hard, shiny substance which drop from your fingers and back to the ground. Interesting. Although everything is coming up roses, you haven't found anything usual except for a few hard substances with dig fall back to the ground so let's keep digging will it let us use g for the again command no will you let us use again oh there we go you, ouch you cut your fingers on a sharp edge as you dig you search carefully in the dirt now that you are sure something is there and pull up a piece of porcelain covered with dirt and mud interesting it's filthy covered with dried mud you can barely make out some designs under the dirt I think we may have found our, uh, uh, what you call it, our, our saucer. So let's uh, analyze porcelain. Sergeant Duffy walks up, takes a fragment from you. I'll return soon with the results. And there we go. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, head to the West Lawn. This is a sprawling lake lawn west of the Robner House. To the west and north is the lake shore. The northeast is a rose garden. To the south, an otherwise lawn. There are no doors or windows at ground level here on the west side of the house. A beautiful rose garden, separated by a tall fence, lies to the north. And the front of the house is to your south. A large lawn bordering the lake lies to the west. You are in front of the Robner house, just west of the front door. To the north is a large bay window, through which can be seen part of the living room. To the northwest is the west side of the house. A car pulls up to the south, and Mr. Coates steps out onto the lawn. We're getting close to the time of the will reading, uh, so that should be something that uh, we attend, I think. Mr. Coates is walking past you. All right, we'll just walk with him into the... Uh, for the living room and everybody's here uh, mr coach shakes your hand i'm glad you're here inspector we'll begin the reading soon so let's go ahead and see our, our suspects examine dunbar miss dunbar wearing a fashionable pantsuit is a rather attractive woman in her early 30s examine lord oh Rourke. Oh, man, I keep doing that. I have like my key. I, I touch type and I have my keys slightly to the left of where they should be. And it's just. Mrs. Rourke is a short woman, more than a bit overweight. She's wearing a maid's outfit. Sam Baxter. Baxter is an immaculately dressed middle aged man with rugged good looks. Examine. Robner. Mrs. Robner is a middle-aged woman of great beauty. She is dressed in black. Examine Coates. Mr. Coates is a rather homely man of advancing years. Ask Robner about Stephen. Is that not how it's spelled? I don't know who you mean. I have no friend named Stephen. Show letter to Robner. You have certainly stooped to a new low, Inspector, opening people's mail. I think there are laws against this sort of thing, but I guess you wouldn't know. I suppose you also know that Stephen is my 
lover and that we were planning to marry. Don't look so melodramatic. I didn't kill my husband. You think my talk of divorce may have driven him to it? Why don't you leave me alone? Oops. Uh, well, we certainly have a lot of tact. <clears throat> All right, let's wait. Mr. Coates appears distracted, looking frequently towards the door. Do you want to keep waiting? Yes. Yes. George steps into the room. Yeah, let's keep waiting. Examine George. Oh, wall of text. George is a young man in his mid-twenties. He is poorly dressed and that each item he is wearing clashes with the others. His attire is of the highest quality, however. He is wearing various pieces of jewelry. Ah, Mr. Coates says. Everybody's here now. Mr. Coates begins. This is an awkward situation. Mr. Robner told me five days ago that he wanted to execute a new will and promised to call me when it was completed. As I never heard from him, I must assume that he either changed his mind or did not complete the new will. Therefore, the one in my possession must be considered the most recent testament. From the corner of your eye, you catch George nodding his head as if in approval and smiling broadly. Continuing, Mr. Coates says, Naturally, should a more recent will exist and be found within a reasonable period, the present one will be voided. I will proceed with the reading of the will here in my hands, which was executed three years ago last month. He reads the will, simply written and direct, leaving equal parts of the estate to his son, George Arthur Robner, and his wife, Mrs. Leslie Phillips Robner. There is some discussion, understated congratulations, and overstated sympathy, which Mr. Coates cut short by clearing his throat. I must leave now, I'm afraid. If you have any questions, I'll be contacted tomorrow. He picks up his phone, dials his office, and asks to be picked up at the Robner estate. Mr. Coates heads to the east. All right, I think we do have the... Yeah, we do, we do have the calendar. Good. Show... Let's go ahead and show the calendar, which is currently to the page where it shows that he was going to update the will the day he died to George. I, uh, I don't really know what to say. I guess that dad, but there is no other. I can't help you. Sorry. George seems to be quite agitated. I've got to be going now. I'll see you later, George says. He starts to leave. He heads off to the east. Let's see where he's going, shall we? Stop following me. My business is private. He heads off to the east again. Please stop following me around like this. Can I have no privacy? I'm simply trying to take care of something personal. George heads upstairs. Stop following me. My business is private. He's going to keep complaining, but he's not going to stop us. We're just going to keep following him. Oh, and here we have the fragment. Uh, for a moment, you muse on Sergeant Duffy's almost magical entrances. The fragment, he begins, contains traces of tea and sugar. In addition, there seems to be some other chemical present that is not a common medication. It could take weeks to determine exactly what it is. It is definitely not emetraxin, ubilin, though. There are no clear fingerprints. With that, he leaves and handing you the fragment as he whisks away. Well, for now, we're going to keep following George. This is George's bedroom. In addition to the normal furnishing, there is a small liquor cabinet, a stereo with records and tapes. The door leading to the hallway to the north is open. Another door to the east is open. Playing on the stereo is a cacophonous electronic jumble. George is lying on his bed, listening intently to a cacophonous electronic jumble. I have business to attend to. Would you mind leaving? All right, we annoyed George enough, I think. And he closes the door behind us. Let's go ahead and um, take a look at this fragment again. While it would take months to determine what the substance is, we do know that low, low blow has a synergistic effect with the antidepressants. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Back to the library, balcony, and this is uh, kind of a tricky timing issue. So 
I'm actually going to save the game here in case I, I screw it up. Image file. And what it's asking for you here is what do you want to save the game as? So we are going to save it as saved. Okay. And we can load the game by with the restore command, telling it image file, saved. And we're just going to wait here on the balcony. Ah, you see George through the doorway, looking through the hallway, and then darting into the library. Curious. George walks purposely towards the bookshelves. He looks around, but you react before he can see you. When you peek out again, George is fiddling with the shelves. His right arm reaches into the shelf, and to your amazement, the unit of bookshelves on the left rotates away from the wall, revealing a darkened room behind. George enters it, trembling with barely controlled fear and excitement. And he's doing this because we showed him the calendar, pretty much. As I said, NPCs will cleave to their schedules unless we interfere, and we did interfere. All right, let's uh, give him some time to do whatever he's doing before following him. A dim light in the hidden closet comes on. In the faint light, you can see George motioning with his right hand. All at once, the swell shelf swings shut. Do you want to keep waiting? Yes. All right, so we've given him 10 minutes. South, examine, bookshelf. The shelves contain many books and manuscripts covering a wide range of subjects. They are meticulously arranged. One book is out of place, however, leaving a gap in the one row. On closer inspection, a small black button can be seen at the back of this gap. Well, obviously, we're going to press the button. The leftmost shelf swings out against the balcony window. As the shelf swings open, George spins to face you. His expression, first seeming wild with happiness, changes to one of panic and horror. He jerks around, trying to feebly conceal a piece of paper in his hands. He jumps towards you, then recoils in fear. Finally, sobbing, he crumples to the floor, clutching a paper beneath him. A large combination safe, embedded in the wall, embedded, huh, is lying open. You enter the hidden closet. This is a secret room situated within the library and the master bedroom. The room is bare and somewhat dusty as if it were not often used. An unmarked, rim, an unmarked switch plate surrounds two buttons, one blue and one red. A formidable safe is embedded in the south wall. The heavy safe door is wide open. The library can be seen through a door in the west. George is holding a new will. Oh my. All right, let's get take the will from George. Give me that, you crumbum. Read it. This is Mr. Robner's new will, disowning George and giving his entire estate to his wife. Well, if that's not motive, I don't know what is. And if we didn't get here in time, if we messed up the timing, he would have destroyed the will. Meaning that we would not have this motive for him. And that's why the timing was important. We had to get there soon enough that he had pulled the will out of the safe, because we don't know how to open it, but not so long that he has the chance to destroy it. A stack of papers bound together is in the safe. All right. Leafing through these papers, it becomes obvious that they incriminate Mr. Baxter in wrongdoings regarding the Focus scandal. The documents, they document funds which are embezzled by Baxter and tell how the scandal was hushed up. This evidence would be sufficient to convict Mr. Baxter in the focus case. Another point of motive for Baxter. Which, we, again, we would never get if we hadn't caught George at this precise moment. Do I have the... No, I don't. All right, we're still waiting on uh, Duffy, I think. So, oh, here we go. Uh, he returns with the fragment. For a moment, you muse on the almost magical entrance. The fragment did contain a low blow. Here is the full report. All right, so let's read the lab report. Dear Inspector, in response to your request for an analysis of the ceramic fragment, we have found evidence of a drug called methspirin, which is usually sold in this country under the name low blow. 
It is a blood pressure lowering agent used primarily in Europe, which explains the oversight in our blood analysis of the deceased. A double check reveals a high blood level of methspirin. While the amount of methspirin in the blood isn't dangerous in itself, a strong reaction between it and various other drugs has been well documented. As you may have gathered, one of those drugs is amitrixin, ubilion. The effects of methspirin is to displace semaxtrin from protein binding, leaving more free in the blood and simulating an overdose. Your new evidence leads me to conclude that the cause of death was amitrixin toxicity secondary to ingestion of methspirin and amitraxin in combination. Sincerely, Arthur Chatworth, pathologist. And there we have it. We have the means of murder. And we are close to solving our case. We just have to figure out who done it. No, wrong button. And here we have our suspects. So what was focus? We saw it both on the pad of paper and in the documents we saw. We saw. So let's ask Baxter about focus. There's a flicker of surprise on Baxter's face. I'm not sure what you mean. Focus Corporation has been a subsidiary of Robner Corp for some years. I failed to see its import. Well, let me show you its import. He reads slowly and leaps through the pages. I'm afraid I haven't been entirely candid with you. There was some trouble a few years ago with Focus Corp because of some, let us say, irresponsible dealings on my part. Marshall agreed to cover up my involvement to save the company bad publicity. And that favor Marshall did was probably what kept Baxter in line regarding this uh, merger with Omnicorp, as Baxter is apparently the majority shareholder. Says Dunbar's here too. We'll ask her about the prescription we found in her cabinet. Ms. Dunbar seems a bit surprised. You found those in my bathroom, didn't you? I've been taking them for months for my blood pressure. Are they important? Well, what do you think of this lab report? She seems stunned, but recovers quickly. He didn't commit suicide then, she says, but low blow, that's a pill I take for my blood pressure. I can tell what you're thinking, but I couldn't have done it. Why should I? Someone must have taken them. Maybe George. He knew I used them. Well, let's see what Baxter thinks. Baxter studies the report carefully. This is quite peculiar. It appears that Marshall was murdered. I wondered... I would have a word with George if I were you, Inspector. And they're both trying hard to implicate George. Well, I'm not buying it, though. Let's go ahead and accuse Dunbar. This isn't arresting her. This is accusing her of the murder to study her reaction. No, I didn't do it. I've worked for Mr. Robner for years. What possible motive could I have? With that, Miss Dunbar begins to cry and move about the room nervously. Miss Dunbar glances at Baxter and then at you. Interesting. Miss Dunbar is walking past you. Do you want to keep waiting? Yes. She heads off to the south. No, let's follow her. Ms. Dunbar stops you and spots you and stops. She reaches into her pocket and pulls out a cigarette. As she does so, what appears to be a ticket stub falls out of her pocket and floats to the ground. She checks her pocket again, apparently for a match, but finds none and puts the cigarette back in her pocket. It's for the Hartford Philharmonic Orchestra. On the day of, on the night of the murder, remember from our interviews that happened outside the game. This is in the feelies. This was uh, Baxter's alibi. He said he was going alone 
to the Philharmonic Orchestra while she said she had gone out with a friend. Oh, I, well, I guess I should tell you. You see, Mr. Baxter and I, we go together to concerts, only occasionally, you understand. We went that night, the night Marshall died. Then he took me home, and that's it. I should have said something before, but I just didn't think it was important and well. I didn't think the others should know we were seeing each other socially. Our, nobody knows about it, you know. Please don't say anything. She seems to be deep in thought. And we have returned to the shed to wait. Uh, and, oh, what do you know? She shows up here. Do we want to keep waiting? Yes. She's looking for something, apparently. But we're going to keep waiting. And this is going to go on for a while. And she's just pacing around, ignoring you. Ah, then Mr. Baxter's here. Now, I want to point out that if we didn't wait here with her for Baxter, uh, he would have murdered her, uh, which is something I learned on an earlier playthrough. Ah, that must be Miss Dunbar's ticket stub. I should have told you earlier, Miss Dunbar was made at the, at the concert on the night that Marshall killed himself. She became ill at intermission and hired a car to take her back home. You see, Inspector, I know that Miss Dunbar appreciates classical music, so I occasionally ask her along to my subscription series. I really should have told the other detective, but I didn't think it mattered. Uh-huh. Well, I don't believe you. In fact, I think they planned the murder and executed it together. Oh, Dundar, West, Baxter, and Dunbar. Text of a letter from the police commissioner Klutz, dated September 5th. Dear Inspector, congratulations on your superb handling of the Robner case. As you have probably heard, a jury convicted Mr. Baxter and Ms. Dunbar today of the murder of Mr. Robner. Thanks to you, the murderers will be behind bars possibly for the rest of their lives. Thank you for a job brilliantly done, which reminds me of another fascinating case I would like to assign you to. Coming soon, another Interlogic Mystery from Infocom. Uh, so yeah, basically, they planned the murder, uh, executed it together to get uh, him out of the way. You know, uh, she climbed up the ladder, uh, swapped the cups after he had died of the overdose, um, and, uh, you know, that was it. Case closed. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this look at an early detective game. I don't like doing a lot of these interaction vi fiction videos because they're not visually interesting, and my throat is so sore from all the talking right now. Big thanks to my channel members for helping support these videos, in particular to More Liberty One and Dragflaz at the $9.99 Buy Me a Sandwich level. Become a channel member for as little as $2.99, price of a cup of coffee, and you'll get access to behind the scene community posts and screenshots. Uh, exclusive member polls, and priority response to comments. I'll just simply see your comments first. Can't afford it? That's cool too. Just subscribe, comment, and liking my videos helps spread the word. Next time, we'll be covering Sierra's classical graphic adventure game, King's Quest.